Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar. An overview of state child welfare's response for trafficking cases involving foreign national children. Let's go over some quick housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. The recording may be shared with additional audiences at the request of the Children's Bureau. This webinar will be interactive, featuring a question and answer session. The slide deck will be sent out along with the recording one to two weeks after the event has occurred. If we are unable to address all questions, we will answer the remaining questions and follow up communication to all participants. There will be an evaluation survey at the end of the event, so please take a moment then to provide us with your feedback. I will now turn it over to Jasmine Clark to begin. Thank you, Chris. So I'll start by introducing the Preventing and Addressing Human Trafficking team. From the Children's Bureau, we have Serena Amin and Laura Fishman. From the Capacity Building Center for States, myself, Jasmine Clark. Next slide, please. And for today's agenda, we have a welcome. We'll have Children's Bureau hot topics and updates. We'll have our presentation about human trafficking and child welfare. We'll have, and we'll have our closing remarks. And today's objectives, increased awareness. Participants will learn how best to help foreign national children that have been exposed to trafficking. Increased knowledge, participants will learn about the types of services foreign national children are entitled to receive. And now I'll turn it over to Serena for hot topics. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jasmine. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here with us today. Um, April is National Child Abuse and Prevention Month. And during this month, we recognize the importance of communities working together to support and strengthen families and prevent child maltreatment. Throughout the year, communities are encouraged to increase awareness about child and family well-being and work together to implement effective strategies that support families and prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, we're going to drop in some resources in the chat for you. So there's the Prevention Month website that'll have an array of resources that are available to you and your teams. Um, I encourage you to look through that um, and um, kind of dive deep into the resources that are provided. And additionally, um, CB will be hosting a Prevention Month event called Thriving and Healthy Kids. We all have a role to play in promoting positive childhood experience. And this is a webinar that will occur on Tuesday, April 23rd from 1 to 2 p.m. And we'll drop in that registration link in the chat. And we encourage everybody to attend for that as well. Um, I'd also like to call your attention to the National Human Trafficking Prevention Framework that was released back in February of this year. This framework is a resource for organizations, communities, and governments seeking to strengthen efforts to prevent human trafficking. It reflects research and best practices in violence prevention, health promotion, as well as the expertise of people with lived human trafficking experience, and as well as allied professionals. We'll go ahead and drop that link um, for your review. And I think our presenter will also be talking a little bit more about that toolkit in depth in her presentation. Um, and I also wanna call attention to um, some opportunities that will be available through ACF and the Children's Bureau. This is the time of year that the Children's Bureau releases their notice of funding opportunities. And I'd like to encourage everyone to keep an eye out on the grants.gov website to hear about upcoming funding announcements that may be relevant to your communities. We really wanna use these opportunities for people to um, apply for these opportunities and engage with us. We think it's a really important way to engage the community and there's always an array of funding opportunities um, that are available through grants.gov. And again, we'll put that in the chat for you. So I think that's all I have today to share in terms of um, hot topics and CB updates. And I do want to make sure we leave enough time for um, the, the great topic that we have for you all today. So we can go ahead and um, move on to the next slide. And with that, I'd like to introduce our um, speaker and a, a wonderful colleague of mine, Lauren Devine, who is the Child Trafficking Prevention and Protection Coordinator with the Office on Trafficking in Persons within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Lauren coordinates with offices across HHS with federal partners and with external stakeholders to prevent and respond to human trafficking among children and youth. Prior to working with the Office of 
trafficking in persons, Lauren worked in various capacities as a social worker in domestic and international child welfare settings. Lauren received a master's of social work in clinical global practice from Boston College and a Bachelor of Arts in political science with a focus on international relations and African studies from the University of Florida. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lauren to dive into the topic of our presentation today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Serena. And I just want to preface this with I am overcoming a sinus infection. And so um, I, if at any point I mute and take a sip of water, um, it's so that you all don't have to hear me coughing, but I hope that I can make it through. i um, really grateful to be on with all of you today. And I see um, a lot of familiar names of um, people that we coordinate and partner with on a regular basis doing incredible work. And so um, I hope that this information is helpful to you. And I really encourage you to um, type in your questions throughout and um, yeah, just making this as much of a conversation as possible. I'm hoping that this information will be helpful to your work. Um, so today we are gonna be talking about the process of responding to trafficking concerns among foreign national children and youth. Um, this includes unaccompanied children. We've heard a lot from states and child welfare that um, they have um, questions when encountering situations when responding to cases of foreign national minors who have experienced trafficking. And we want to just give an overview of resources available to these clients and also just provide a space for you to ask questions um, and as well as share resources with you. So next slide. So the Office on Trafficking and Persons, for those of you who aren't familiar, is located in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for children and families. So we are a sister office to Children's Bureau um, and work very closely with our colleagues across ACF, including in the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, next slide. You may often hear our acronym as OTIP. Um, and so that's really just our, our title of our office. Um, but our office started in January, 2015 with the mission to address human trafficking um, from a public health framework. So for those of you who are familiar with the public health perspective, um, we really wanna look at primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So how do we prevent trafficking from occurring in the first place? And then should it occur, how, what services and supports um, should be put in place to help individuals rebuild their lives and become self-sufficient? Next slide. So looking at the public health framework, um, we often are thinking about trafficking from that criminal justice framework. And so the public health framework really brings together all the different um, groups and entities working together, including child welfare. Um, and so uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but this uh, model helps kind of describe what that is. Next slide. So our office has three major functions. Um, protection, prevention, and research and policy. Oh, and I see in the chat that um, people are having a hard time hearing. Is that across the board or just one person? If so, I can switch out my volume. It is hard to hear. Okay, let me try. Oh, volume is fine. Let me, I, I see a mixed response. Okay, I'm going to continue on, but if, it, if there's an issue with hearing me, um, please let me know again, and I'll switch out my volume. Um, but thank you for flagging that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, someone is having trouble. Okay, let me fix something. I'm so sorry. Let me just make sure. Is that any better for those of you who are having trouble? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Much better. Perfect. Okay. So um, our office has three major functions, protection, prevention, and research and policy. Under the protection division is all our victim service, assistance activities, grant programs, um, child eligibility and adult certification, um, all of our child victim coordination activities, and then of course the National Human Trafficking Hotline. In prevention, we have all of our training and technical assistance, survivor engagement, public awareness, regional coordination and prevention education, and then research and policy is pretty self-explanatory. Um, our office really seeks to uh, be responsive to the field and the individuals on the ground. We see you all as the experts, so we really view you as partners in this work. And as for myself, I'm a social worker. I, I you know, previously working in child welfare um, and in foster care. And um, I feel like it's just so important that we're in regular dialogue. So if out of this conversation, 
um, you know, you have specific resources or perspectives or things that you want to share back with us um, or have questions, um, please know that we would love to partner and we would love to learn and um, support your work. So please reach out. My, my contact information is at the end, but I really look forward to hearing from you um, following this presentation. Next slide. Um, so today I'm going to be specifically talking about um, human trafficking among foreign national children and youth. Um, everyone on this call is pretty comfortable with what is human trafficking. Um, we talk about it from a really you know, broad perspective. But who on this call um, knew that there is a 24-hour reporting requirement for federal, state, and local officials to report trafficking concerns among foreign national children to our office? So Sarah knew. <laughs> anyone else? Is anyone else familiar with this? A couple of you know. Yes. Why? I think means yes, yes. Okay, so good. Some people are familiar with it. Um, did you know that the trafficking doesn't have to have occurred here in the United States? So it could have been 10 years ago in the child's home country. Um, and we can still get that case and um, issue refugee benefits to that child. Did you know that? <laughs> no? Okay, great. So there's a mixture of, of responses. And so really um, what I am hoping that comes out of today is that for those of you um, who do know about this process that you can learn, learn a little bit more and ask questions, but for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I want you to see our, our work and our office's resources as a resource and support to you to partner with you in your work. So if you come into contact um, with a foreign national child or youth and they report being forced to work or asked to make or made to engage in commercial sex at any point in their life and in any country and they're currently under the age of 18, you should refer that case to us so we can connect them to refugee benefits and case management services. We can also coordinate with you um, and troubleshoot uh, through different areas and advocacy and help ensure safe placements for these children. Um, so there's a lot that we can do. Um, we can also do training, et cetera. So um, just kind of keep that in mind while we're talking through the process. And this next section, I'm gonna be talking about definitions. I know you all are familiar with what human trafficking is, but the reason I'm talking through these definitions is our office may view things or interpret the law for foreign national minors for the purpose of benefits in a way that's a little bit different than what you might be familiar with. So I just want to make sure to cover those nuances. Um, and so with that, we will go to the next slide. So human trafficking of a minor, um, when we as an office um, are looking at cases, we're specifically looking under 22 U.S. Code 7102 or the TVPA, as many of you all know, Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Um, and looking at the law, labor trafficking or forced labor is the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, or obtaining of a child for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to um, involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And then sex trafficking or commercial sex is the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining, Soliciting or patronizing, so those two actions were added um, after the passing of the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, of a child for the purpose of engaging in a commercial sex act. All right, next slide. So one of the things that our, our office um, parses out the difference between is trafficking versus smuggling. Um, so this may be surprising or not surprising to you, but our office, office receives about 4,000, um, lately about 4,000 cases a year um, of potential trafficking for foreign national children and youth. Um, of those cases, we issue between 2,000 to 2,500 um, eligibility letters granting children um, access to refugee benefits, as well as additional interim assistance letter, giving those children up to 120 days of benefits while we're figuring out the case. Um, and so in a lot of those cases, we see concerns of concerning smuggling schemes. Um, so maybe the child is forcibly brought to the United States, um, treated in a way that um, causes some type of harm to the child during their journey to the United States. But obviously smuggling in and of itself is not trafficking. Um, you know, trafficking can involve smuggling, it can involve transportation, but trafficking is simply forced labor or commercial sex. So if we have information that the child was being smuggled to the United States 
for the purpose of forced labor or commercial sex, even if they didn't actually engage in it, we can issue benefits to that child. So if we find out that someone paid for their journey so that the child will come have sex with them um, in exchange, we can say that that child was in the midst of a, of a commercial sex, sex trafficking scheme, was transported for the purpose of commercial sex and issue refugee benefits um, through what's called an eligibility letter. Or let's say we have information that the child gets to the United States and someone is demanding that they come to their placement um, so that they can work to pay off the debt. The child feels threatened, coerced. In that situation, we may be able to say that the child was transported for the purpose of uh, forced labor. Also, often children during their smuggling schemes are um, forced to work against their will or made to have sex in exchange for the cost of the journey. So there's a lot of intersection between smuggling and trafficking, but smuggling in and of itself, as you know, is not trafficking. Take a sip of water and next slide. So another common type of case um, trend that we see is ransom. <clears throat> we see a lot of cases where children are held in a warehouse um, and while they're held there, their families are contacted and told, um, you know, you have to send money or we are not gonna let your, um, your this child be released from this warehouse, um, threatening to kill the child. What's missing in that case is that forced labor or commercial sex. So ransom in and of itself is not trafficking. However, if while the child is held for ransom, they're forced to do chores, they're forced to do construction, they're forced to do some type of labor or service, or they're told your ransom will, you, will be paid for if you have sex with me, um, then we potentially have a case of trafficking. There's also times, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, where if a child is made to engage in sex acts over and over, so sexual assault um, on a pattern basis can be considered what's called involuntary sexual servitude as a form of labor trafficking. In that, in that sense, that would also be a situation where when a child is held for ransom, if they're sexually assaulted on a repeated basis, that could also be um, a situation of trafficking. So again, ransom in and of itself is not trafficking. Um, but it can entail uh, some kind of trafficking may have occurred. And so what we encourage practitioners to do is if they have a case of um, where a child indicates that they were held for ransom, it's always good to explore further. Um, you know, tell me more about your schedule while you were held. Talk to me more about what you did each day. And if they indicate um, concerns of being made to do chores, being made to, to work, um, being sexually assaulted, um, that could be a situation of trafficking. All right, next slide. So labor trafficking of minors is the recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, or obt obtaining of a child for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, penage, debt bondage, or slavery. I used to literally have this definition uh, printed on my cubicle, and I just always felt like it was so complicated when I would get a case to even know where to begin. And so this AMP model, um, really helps me, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, the action means purpose model, to basically break up this definition. Because as you all know, we don't use these, this terminology um, on a regular basis to, um, to talk about, you know, what is peonage? It's not something we talk about on a regular basis. So having this, this model, the action means purpose model or AMP model can be really helpful. So the actions for, for trafficking, uh, for labor trafficking are recruiting, harboring, transporting, providing, obtaining. The means are forced fraud and coercion, and the purposes are involuntary servitude, debt bondage, peonage, or slavery. Our child protection team, when they receive a case, will triage it. They'll look at the information provided and then assess, do I see any action, means, and purpose uh, related to labor trafficking? If they do, if they're able to identify an action, means, and purpose, that child is eligible for benefits. If they don't, they're going to explore further and ask more questions before issuing a denial letter or an interim assistance letter. So for example, if a child indicates that they were walking down the street and MS-13 said, hey, you have to sell these drugs for me, I'm gonna kill you. Um, if that child then sells the drugs because they're scared they're gonna be killed, that would be a case of labor trafficking. The child would have been recruited through coercion for the purpose of involuntary servitude. So we just need to be able to identify one action, one means and one purpose, and we can say that that child is eligible for benefits. Next slide. So with that in mind, we get a lot of questions around labor exploitation. 
um, situations where children are working in hazardous work environments, um, working in situations that are unsafe. Maybe they're not getting paid what they're promised or they're having um, to, they're unclear about um, what their written earning statements is. Maybe they're having pay withheld. Maybe there's some type of wage theft going on. All of that entails labor exploitation. What brings that into a case of labor trafficking is what you see here. So threatened to pay debt and expenses, threats or use of violence, demoralized, intimidation, control, movement to work uh, to um, to their work is controlled, they're controlled or monitored in some way. Often it's when they live at their work site or live with their employer, um, use or threatened use of the law, threat of deportation, physical beatings. So often what we do see is cases where there's labor exploitation. As we dig further, as that child gets support, as rapport is built, often those cases then fall into labor trafficking. So if you ever have and come across a case of labor exploitation for a foreign national minor, you're not really quite sure if there's actually labor trafficking occurring, but you know that there's some type of exploitation, you can still refer that case to us and we can issue what's called interim assistance. That interim assistance gives that child 120 days of refugee benefits while things are being uh, determined. And we can also connect them to a case manager. Um, so again, labor exploitation in and of itself is not trafficking, but it might entail that there is labor trafficking occurring. Next slide. Okay, and then next um, is sex trafficking or commercial sex. Um, and as you all know, because of the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, we have two more actions for sex trafficking, soliciting and patronizing. Soliciting is the ask or offer of something of value to have sex. So it would be, hey, I'll pay you $50 to have sex with me. Even if the child says no, walks away, that child was solicited for the purpose of a commercial sex act. And then patronizing is when there's a third party involved. So an example of patronizing would be a landlord tells their grandparent, tells a grandparent, hey, if you let me have sex with your grandchild, your rent and your utilities will be paid for. Um, even if the grandparent says, no, that can't happen, that child was being patronized for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Um, and then purpose, obviously, commercial sex act, sex act in exchange for something of value. Um, and because we're talking about minors, there doesn't need to be any force, fraud, or coercion identified. Um, so the child can state, I willingly had sex to get that jewelry. I wanted to have sex to get that shelter or to get that money. Regardless of the statement and the child's perception of willingness, um, because that child is a child, there doesn't need to be any force from a coercion to indicate that they are a victim of sex trafficking. All right, next slide. Um, some other nuances to um, talk through with sex trafficking is the something of value can include money, food, shelter, gifts, transportation. It doesn't have to just be money. It can also include debt. Um, sexual act, as defined in federal law, is under 18 U.S. Code 2246, and it's oral, anal, vaginal sex, digital penetration, or touching underneath the clothing in the genital region. So we need to indicate that there is something of value in exchange for a sex act for it to be um, considered sex trafficking. We get a lot of cases related to child sexual abuse material. So maybe a child is told, hey, um, send me a nude photo and I'll pay you $50. That would be not be, sorry, that would not be a sex act in exchange for something of value because the child would simply be posing nude in the photos or video. That would be child sexual abuse material. Um, but would bring that into a case of trafficking would be if the child is engaging in sex acts or being depicted to engage in sex acts in the photos or videos that are being distributed or sold or that they're being offered money for. Another time that child sexual abuse material can be trafficking is labor trafficking. So we have received cases um, where children are asked to uh, provide photos. It could even be nude photos um, and pose for photos on a repeated basis and threatened, similar to what people might refer to as extortion. Um, and it could fall under what's considered labor trafficking, a form of servitude. Um, so if you ever have a case of child sexual abuse material um, for a foreign national minor, and you're not sure whether it falls into either of those definitions, um, another option in addition to submitting the case to us is actually staffing the case with our child protection team. We have a case staffing line that you can reach out to. Um, the information for that line is on a slide coming up, but 
Um, I'm also going to put it in the chat box so you have our team's number. Um, and you can always reach out to staff at Case there. So it's 202-205-4582. And then of course, I went over this earlier, but just a reminder, um, because of the definition of soliciting, even if the sex act or exchange never actually occur, solicitation for a commercial sex act alone may be considered sex trafficking of a minor. Next slide. Um, again, you all will get these slides. Um, uh, yeah, no problem, Sarah. Yeah, it can be really complicated when looking at um, sexual extortion and labor trafficking um, and the nuances of that. And so I would encourage you that if you have questions, in addition to reaching out to our chat line, you can email me um, to um, set up a meeting and we can talk through the case um, and, and parse out what you all are seeing because it can be very complicated and nuanced and we definitely want to support you in that. Um, it doesn't also have to be a foreign national minor. If you just have questions generally and are trying to parse out some questions around trafficking, we are very happy to support. Um, and we'll have this information at the end, but we've developed a lot of resources recently in coordination with our colleagues at Children's Bureau, some micro learnings, toolkit, and other resources related to screening and responding to trafficking um, that are available to you. Um, so definitely here to support you in that. Um, Yes, yes, definitely, Sarah. That's a great point. Um, bringing up that the response side can be really hard, especially in cases where um, labor trafficking isn't yet in your state defined under child abuse law. That's that's a great point. Um, so, for um, and, and and to that point too, the reason it's so important that the reason I really want to talk to these definitions is there might be a situation where. Maybe our state has only a sex trafficking or trafficking response to caregivers, but you have a case of a foreign national minor who's experienced trafficking. They can still be referred to us for services, even if it's not necessarily um, a child welfare response in your state, or there, there might be different um, requirements. Just know that there still are resources available to them. So um, wanting to really highlight that. And so thanks, Sarah, for pointing that out. Um, these are just kind of going through those actions. Um, so this is for both labor and sex trafficking. Um, the first five are labor and sex trafficking, and the last two are just sex trafficking. That's why it has a little asterisk next to it. But for each of these, we just have to show that the action was successful. So recruiting is, was a child singled out and made to do something? Um, harboring is, um, were they held in some way or were they monitored or stalked? We've received quite a few cases where children are followed, um, by an individual and told, um, I want you to sell drugs for me or do this task or this service for me. Um, often it's by a gang member and the child will say no. And that individual will come to their house, they'll text them, they'll call them, they'll show up. And it's in a sense, the child feels harbored or monitored. And because of that, they'll flee that country and come to the United States to get away from that situation. So even though the recruitment wasn't successful, we would say that the harboring was successful enough to make that child flee and come to the United States. So with labor trafficking, even if the actual labor doesn't occur, if we can show that the action was successful, we can often still connect that child to support. Um, it really is just like a case by case situation. Transporting of a child is, was a child moved from one location to another for the purpose of the forced labor or commercial sex? Um, so a lot of those are in those smuggling schemes, or it could simply be that the child was driven somewhere and transported somewhere for the purpose of the forced labor or commercial sex. Um, providing of a child is, was a child provided out to a third party um, person or employer? Obtaining is, was a child grabbed in some way? And the final two, soliciting and patronizing. So soliciting was a child offered or promised money or something of value to engage in a sex act. And then patronizing is that example uh, I gave of the landlord, grandparent, um, where there's a third party involvement. Um, all right, so next slide. Means, we're gonna just talk about labor trafficking because for sex trafficking of a minor, there doesn't have to be any means. So force is physical. Um, it's anything physical that happens to the child in relation to the child being made to work. So are there any examples of sexual assaults, beatings, physical confinement, or isolation? Coercion is psychological, so threats of serious harm or manipulation, climate of fear, um, threat of deportation, threatening the safety of the child, 
Um, it could also be the child's perception of coercion. So maybe they know that that person has previously harmed someone else and that's why they're, they're complying with the work. Um, and then fraud is deception. So false promises about work and living conditions, use of fraudulent travel documents, fraudulent employment offers, withholding wages or changes in the nature in the agreement or nature of relationship. All right, next slide. And then finally, it's uh, the purpose column. So in the ant model, we have the action means purpose. And in the purpose, it's both safe labor and sex trafficking. The first is involuntary servitudes. This is what we see the most when we see labor trafficking cases. And this is forced labor, a scheme, plan, or pattern, basically where a child is made to believe that if they don't do the work, something will happen to them or someone else. Um, this can also include involuntary sexual servitude. So often cases of sexual assault um, may also apply as a type of involuntary servitude or involuntary sexual servitude. We also see cases of domestic servitude under this. Um, then debt bondage. So this is labor associated with the debt that no matter how much the child works, that debt um, increases or never decreases, or there's an interest on the debt that makes it impossible for the child to pay off. So in that last slide, when we talked about means, often there are situations where the, the coercion um, is actually the debt itself. So the child is coerced into the work because they can't get out of the debt. And then peonage is labor with threat of harm that's connected to a debt. So anytime you have peonage, you're gonna have involuntary servitude. Um, and it's a type of involuntary servitude associated with a debt. And the debt could be real. So maybe the child um, you know, took out a loan for $50, and but in relation to that, they're being threatened and forced to work. Um, and then slavery is where the child is, in a sense, owned for the purpose of performing labor or services. We don't see slavery cases often, but we do see them um, every now and, and now and then. And then finally, Commercial Sex Act is just for sex trafficking. And this is, again, any sex act in exchange for something of value. Next slide. Okay, so we went through a lot of definitions. Um, this next slide is talking about common trends that we see among foreign national children. Um, we see a lot of cases related to commercial sex and smuggling, where the child is asked or made to engage in sex acts in exchange for the cost of their journey, shelter, immigration documents, food, etc. We see a lot of domestic and sexual servitude cases where a child is held against their will and forced to perform sex acts or household duties. Forced criminality, where a child is forced to perform services for gangs or cartels with threat of harm for noncompliance. Um, and this can also, to Sarah's point earlier in the chat, this can be also really hard from a response and protection side. So forced criminality may present as the child performing something criminal in nature, stealing a car, selling drugs. But as, as you build rapport with that child and better understand, you may learn that that child also um, is a victim of trafficking and was forced to do those acts. And those can be very complicated um, as uh, parsing out through both the child welfare response, the service provision response, as well as if law enforcement is involved due to the criminal nature of the act. And then we have forced labor and smuggling, um, where children are forced to perform some type of labor or service in relation to the smuggling. Forced labor by caregiver, we do see a lot of family work cases, um, and then forced labor on the child's journey. Next slide. So these are some common potential indicators. Um, so um, seeing for cases, um, it's instances of sexual assault to further assess for commercial sex. And these typically are in matching colors to the last slide, but um, really what it's trying to show is that if you see these type of indicators, to know that it may indicate one of those things. And so obviously um, sexual assault and forced chores don't necessarily mean for sure that it's trafficking, but it could be a really strong indicator that trafficking is occurring. Um, also, labor by a caregiver, particularly when the minor is not attending school. Um, labor concerns where the minor isn't in school or working long hours to pay off debts could be really strong indicators. I do see a chat, um, and I wanted to read it. So forced criminality is especially hard when the child is forced to be involved in recruiting or otherwise arranging commercial sex. Yes, that is a great example of a very complicated forced criminality case. So if a child is perpetrating, um, involved in the perpetration of the commercial sex, 
um, but is being forced to do that, um, that can be really, really complicated. So that's a great flag and um, is really hard to un uh, have a response to um, in terms of just like all the complexities of that. So that's a really, really good, good one to bring up. Um, next slide. So this is breaking up more of those forced criminality cases. So um, in addition to what Sarah has posed in the chat box, we also see a lot of distribution, um, transportation, and sale of illicit substances, surveillance activities. Children are forced to stay on guard, monitor, surveil, or look out um, for rival groups or law enforcement, um, co forced to collect rent, toll, quota, almost forced to extort others, um, foot guiding, so forced to bring people over the border into the United States often, um, personal sexual servitude as a form of gain initiation, which, which is kind of similar in some ways to what Sarah was talking about in re regards to recruitment um, schemes for commercial sex. And then another one that's not um, as common, but we do see is decoy cases where children are forced to um, come across the border of the United States and pose as someone's child in order for that person to come across. And they're often used over and over to do that. So we consider those decoy cases. All right, next slide. Okay, so we are before, actually, before I do this, any questions so far? We're going to do a few test your knowledge on what we talked about, but any questions so far with what we've gone over or anything you'd want to highlight beyond what you already have in the chat box? Okay, awesome. So we will start. This first test of knowledge is the minor disclosed that since he started living with his cousin, he has had to pay rent, food, and other, he has had to pay for rent, food, and other basic needs. The minor feels that he has to work or he won't be able to live with his cousin. The minor is not enrolled in school because he's working during school hours. The minor reports that he's working voluntarily because he wants to be able to send money back home to his family in Guatemala. So if this is a case you got, what would you do? What do you think is going on? Is it trafficking? Is it not? What do we need to know? What is the response? Any thoughts? And you can type them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. And unmuting has been enabled, so if you want to unmute yourself, you can, or you can type in the chat box. Hi, good morning. My name is Maria. I'm with Volunteers of America. Hi. Um, I have a similar situation. Um, so what we did is we just kind of got um, the legal guardian involved and kind of walked them through the process of enrolling them into school because... Um, since they didn't have legal documentation, they thought that they didn't have to go to school. So in my scenario, um, the, the legal guardians were just a little unaware of the services and requirements the minor needed. Um, so we just kind of did a hand-holding approach to help them enroll them into school and let them know that the child was not to work, that the main priority was for them to go to school um, and continue providing them services. So we did ESL for them. We did um, create it, help them create an ILP um, and just monitor their, um, their not day-to-day -day duties, but activities um, weekly or monthly. Thank you so much. That's such a great firsthand example. And just the work that you all did both to respond and prevent exploitation put uh, supportive protective factors in place, like that's incredible. And I think um, that's such a good example of what you all did is, is really kind of assessing the situation, seeing that the need was really not a situation of the caregiver exploiting the child, but more of a situation of just a not an understanding that the child couldn't work, getting them connected to school, um, getting them resources, doing safety planning. Um, so that's great. Thank you so much for talking through that. And yeah. I see a couple in the chat box of, it doesn't seem like trafficking from the submitted information, but it's concerning that the child's not attending school and potentially violating child labor laws. And then another is not enough to be human trafficking, but enough facts to look deeper. Yeah, um, this is perfect. And so 
in a case like this, we would want exactly what was done, um, the example that someone um, shared when they unmuted themselves and what's being described in the chat. Um, with what we have here, we don't have any indication that the child is being forced to work against their will, but we have a lot of indicators and concerns. So putting those protective factors in place, better understanding the situation, safety planning, helping the child to understand their rights, um, safety planning with them to say, you know, you have the right to safe work. Um, you know, you indicated that you're working voluntarily, um, but you also mentioned that you feel like if you don't work, you won't, you won't be able to live with your cousin. Can you tell me, tell me more about that? You know, what, tell me, tell me why you feel that way. And if they say, oh, my cousin threatened me, um, then we would have a different situation. So really just exploring with the child, building trust. Um, but uh, yeah, this is great. And the reason we have these examples of not these clear cut cases is because this is, as you all know, um, often how it presents. It's never, it's not always, you know, this clear cut situation. And so this is one of those cases where we would definitely recommend safety planning. We have a good safety planning toolkit from our grantee, um, specifically for working with foreign national children that the, the resource is linked at the end of the presentation. So we'll make sure to highlight that for you. So great. All right, next slide. The next one is the minor reported that she's been approached multiple times at school by gang members pressuring her to sell drugs. The minor reported that they have threatened to harm her and she thinks that they would kill her if she doesn't do what they ask. She reports that she's refused, but she's afraid to go to school because they continue to approach her. Um, so kind of the same thing on this. Anyone have anything like this? What would you do? Is this trafficking? Is this not? Um, any questions? So in this case, we would actually say that this is either an interim assistance or eligibility um, that the child was being harbored um, through the use of coercion for involuntary servitude. Um, the harboring is that monitoring. So she's being followed, she's being approached, she doesn't feel like she can go to school, she's being threatened that she'd be killed. And so even though the labor didn't occur, this is enough for sure to refer the case to us so that we can connect her to services and better understand what might be going on um, and see if she's in a scheme. On that last slide too, even though uh, it's a situation where the child says that they're voluntarily working, if it's something that you're feeling just in your gut, there might be more going on, you can refer that case to us and we can still connect them to services and potentially issue interim assistance because of the potential exploitation. So, um, Again, these cases are always going to be like this. They're going to be nuanced. And so um, we would rather lean on the side of connecting children to resources and support. Um, and so always lean on the side of sending them to us. All right, next slide. Um, this one is the minor disclosed that he was contacted by a man through social media offering to pay for his journey to the United States. The minor stated that at first he was asked to send nude photos and later he was told that he would have to engage in sex acts with a man upon arrival in the US. The minor reported that he feared the man because he owed him a debt for his journey and felt that he didn't have a choice. So same questions on this one, any thoughts? You can either unmute yourself or put your thoughts in the chat box. So this is a case that we would say is sex trafficking. This child would get an eligibility letter. Yes, perfect. Go, go, Caitlin. Um, it is a solicitation for, for sex trafficking due to the exchange of value of the journey for sex acts, exactly. Now, if you got this case and they just said it was the nude photos um, and it was an exchange for the cost of the journey, we would also have a lot of questions and we would still encourage you to send this to us so we can connect the child to resources because often we would then learn that there's more going on. But yes, exactly. This is a case of sex trafficking. 
um, even though the sex acts didn't occur. So yeah, great job. All right, next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to talk through the process to send us a case. So it's called the child eligibility process. Um, and the form is called a request for assistance form. It used to be a PDF document, but for the last, I believe five years now or six years, um, we have a system called Shepherd um, where you can submit the case to us virtually and our team will receive it and go back with you through the system. It's pretty easy to create an account. Um, we just set it up and submit the concerns. So we're going to talk through what that looks like. All right, next slide. So the child eligibility process is based under 20, the TVPA under 22 U.S. Code 7105. Um, it says that um, all federal, state, and local officials are to report potential trafficking concerns on behalf of foreign national minors, which includes unaccompanied children, to HHS within 24 hours. So this is a federal reporting requirement. And then the benefits letter is that upon receipt of credible information that a foreign national minor experienced trafficking, OTIP issues an eligibility letter to the child, making them eligible, eligible to apply for benefits and services to the same extent as a refugee. So this is where kind of this whole process comes from. And that's a little tiny picture of the eligibility letter. All right, next slide. So the federal reporting requirements for trafficking of a child are to our to our office for foreign national minors, as well as, as you all are very familiar with, um, child protective services. So human trafficking is included in the definition of child abuse. And so always also in addition to sending cases to us for foreign national minors, um, also making sure to report accordingly. Next slide. So the child eligibility process administratively is that a person has concerns that a foreign national minor may have experienced labor or sex trafficking. And even though it's federal, state, local officials, um, anyone can send us a case. Also, if we don't get it within the 24 hours, that is absolutely fine. We just need to get it before the child's 18th birthday. Um, otherwise, it will go through the adult certification process, which requires immigration status and other resources. And so this is um, much easier. Yeah, definitely, Sarah. Um, so the individual submits a request for assistance to us on behalf, minor's behalf in Shepherd, um, OTIP's online case management system within 24 hours of identifying the potential concerns. The OTIP child protection team um, reviews the case and corresponds with the requester um, to determine whether there's trafficking in accordance with the TVPA of 2000. And then if we determine <clears throat> that the child experienced trafficking, we'll issue an eligibility letter and refer the child to case management services. We actually typically refer the child to case management services through our TVAP and Aspire program early on in the process, as soon as we get the case, if there seems to be potential trafficking concerns, but we absolutely will refer them at the time the letter is issued. Next slide. <clears throat> so the different determination types is one eligibility letter um, that gives a child the benefit status of a refugee, Interim assistance is 120 days of benefits, and then denial is basically us saying, we don't see any concerns of trafficking. Um, you could always resubmit the case to us, though, before the child's 18th birthday. Next slide. This is what Shepherd looks like, um, and it's probably hard to see on your screen, I don't know, but you would just click on Add Child Request to send us the case. Next slide. This is a QR code to Shepherd, as well as our child trafficking inbox and our phone number to staff cases. Um, I encourage you all to set up an account. The only frustrating part is that your account will lock, I think after 30 days of you not going in. So um, maybe just log in every 29 days. <laughs> um, where does the letter go? Um, so the letter is mailed to you physically um, to the address that you identify along with the benefits handout. Um, and then we also, it comes through Shepherd as a PDF, but the physical letter is mailed to you. This is an IT issue, not content, but we have lots of problems with the Shepherd website not functioning properly. Thank you, Caleb. I really encourage you to let me know. You can CC me on any time you have troubles with this, and I really encourage you to let me know if you're ever having problems with Shepherd or what those problems are, because we want to make sure it is fixed and that you're not running into that. And I'm so sorry to hear that you're having those issues. And if I know it takes extra work, but if you can email me after this with just a summary of those problems so I can pass it along so we can make sure to fix it. 
that would be awesome. But thank you so much for flagging that. Um, and yes, you will absolutely get a copy of this presentation. Would we be responsible to deliver the letter to someone? Yeah, so if you send the case to us, we would actually, we ask you, um, there's like in the form, there's a place for where, where to mail the letter. Um, and then we would just confirm with you where to send it. So if you want us to mail it directly to the child or to you, you would just explain where it's going. These are great questions though. All right, next slide. Yes, Sarah, that's a great question. So is there an easy way to check if a child already has been referred? So we have a letter verification page um, where benefit issuing agencies, once they get the letter, they look at the five digit tracking number on the letter at the top right hand corner. And then they just put in a couple of data points from the letter and it can verify if the child's eligible. So the only way to know is if you actually have the physical letter. And the purpose of that is that we don't want um, someone random, like let's say, Sarah, I have your name and your date of birth. I don't, it, the purpose is we wouldn't want me to be able to just go on and type in Sarah Ladd and your date of birth and know if you have an eligibility letter. So the point is that you're supposed to physically actually have the letter to be able to check. Um, if you don't have that, but you're wondering, you can always reach out to us at child trafficking at acf.hhs.gov and ask us um, or call us and we can confirm. These are the benefits that the child is eligible for. So um, refugee cash assistance, Medicaid, TANF, et cetera. Next slide. I only have five minutes, so I'm gonna go quickly. Um, they also are referred to Aspire Case Management Services, which is our case, manager, case management grantee provider, um, which has regional coordinators. So if you wanna know who your regional coordinator is, let me know and I can connect you. We can do trainings, we can set up coordination calls set up some SOPs for how to send cases to us. And then they also have case managers all throughout the United States. They also do a lot of coordination with the DOJ Office for Victims of Crime Grant Network, as well as ORR post-release services. Are they eligible without regard to who has custody? Great question. So if the child is in custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, they're already actively like in a shelter, they're already getting those services, so they wouldn't. Um, but if they are, um, if they have an eligibility letter, they are a victim of severe form of trafficking in persons and eligible for, um, the state would be eligible for Title IV-E funds as the child is a victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons. But then sometimes, depending if the child is in the care of the state, they may get their Medicaid or other resources through their letter or through the state. It really just depends. I've kind of seen it go different ways. But um, Blanca, if you want to follow up with me on that, I think that's your name. I can't see the full name on um, there, we can troubleshoot a little bit more. All right, next slide. Um, so this is some of the coordination our Aspire team and TVAP teams can do. So the regional coordination, case management, and then if the child is 18 or older or becomes 18 or older, um, youth and adults can access our TVAP case management program. Next slide. Um, coordination generally, um, we can coordinate and advocate with state and local child protective services consult with requesters on questions, do trainings. Um, will you be able to talk today about what the coordination looks like and how child protection agencies and law enforcement are involved in coordinating once a child has been given a letter? It's often quite complicated with many partners, especially for unaccompanied minors. Yes, Sarah, that's a great question. So perfect timing for our coordination slide. Um, I did not ask Sarah to ask that question then, but it was perfect. So this is a great question. So there's times where we get a case and a child is in a state um, they have active trafficking concerns, and it's really complicated to have everyone brought to the table and know what to do. So we set up coordination calls all the time um, with our grant program, with the regional coordinator, with the case management program, with the local child protective services to figure out what's in the best interest of the child, placement, and kind of all of those things. So we are here to support. Um, and Sarah, if there's anything specifically that I missed, let me know. But please, anytime you have a complicated case and you're just like, what do I do? please email me. Um, you can also email our child trafficking line. I unfortunately don't work 24 seven, um, but I always, we always want to support. So um, I'm putting my email there and um, we can definitely help support you. Um, some states have specific SOPs, some agencies have specific SOPs with us. So really happy to coordinate on that. All right, next slide. I think I have negative one minute. So I'm going to just go really quickly. These are trends and resources. Um, next slide. 
Um, we have, in 2022, we issued over 2,226 letter, eligibility letters. Um, last year, we issued about the same, and we're on track to be in similar this year. Next slide. Um, we mostly see cases of labor trafficking, pretty even split between male and female, um, mostly for clients ages 13 to 17. And the top countries of origin um, are mostly Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico. Next slide. This is our new handout. It's a step-by-step -step benefits guide of the process to access benefits with your eligibility or interim assistance letter. We'll mail this out as a brochure, as a hard copy with the letter. And we also have this on our website. Um, it is uh, also available currently in Spanish, um, but will be translated into other languages soon. Um, and it is long and lengthy, but it really goes through all the details. So um, we're hoping that it really helps clients be able to navigate all of that process. And if you run into trouble accessing benefits, our Aspire TVAC team is there to help. All right, next slide. These are some resources you can check out. Next slide. <laughs> These are some other youth-specific resources, including our SOAR online training for child welfare, our microlearnings, microsite, and some other resources. We also have some new Look Beneath the Surface public awareness campaign resources coming out for this population in the next month. So be on the lookout. Um, next slide. Uh, I was supposed to talk more about this, but I ran out of time. So the National Human Trafficking Prevention Framework is online. You can access it, check it out. We really want to partner with you in this. And if you have any questions, reach out and I can connect you to the right people. Next slide. And this is my contact information, which you all will get these slides. Um, but that's that. I'm supposed to have a couple minutes for questions, so please feel free to ask them. But then I'm going to pass to um, the TA team and Children's Bureau back to you for next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was great. Do we have any questions for Lauren briefly? Okay, we have from Sarah, a thought from, for later. It would be really helpful to have another training that's more specific about the role and coordination, child protection, law enforcement, and even county and district attorney, both on the criminal and child protective side. There's often a lot of confusion about placement services and roles once a child receives a letter. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, you heard her. Um, yeah, thank actually, you for great information. E okay, email ahead. me that, Sarah, and we will set that up. <laughs> awesome, Sarah. Yes, let's do it. I that's you, Lauren. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, if we have any other questions, we'll email Lauren and we'll put it out in... Okay, we have one more. It sounds like there may be cases that come up where the child is eligible for services, but a child protective case may not be... What's opened because it doesn't meet screener requirements. So yeah, I guess we definitely have to do a part two for this. Um, so if we don't have any questions, I'll just briefly go through the closing slides and we'll get you guys out of here by three o'clock. Next slide, please. So we have coming up, we have National Foster Care Month is in May. We have an event May 16th from 2 to 3.30. Please register for the event. It's called Align with Youth, Developing Lifelong Relationships and Supportive Networks. Yes, the recording will be shared. Um, next slide, please. And also, May is very busy. We have SWEBI, which is a Child Welfare Virtual Expo, May 22nd through the 23rd. You can also register through that clickable link. Next slide, please. And it's also been dropped in a chat as well. So after this presentation, you will receive a valuation survey. It's really important that you complete that survey. That's how we know at the center what you want to hear and if you liked what you heard today. Next slide, please. Again, just stay connected with the center. That's a clickable link. I'm assuming you guys are all on Gov Delivery because you received the registration announcement for this informative webinar. Next slide, please. And again, that's our contact information, our website, our email, our phone number. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you so much to our wonderful presenter, Laura Devine. Lauren Devine, excuse me. Um, that was very informative. And I guess look out for part two. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. We are now closing the call.